Well, this is very kind of you, Dr. Nieto. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to come back to Madison and to be in this department. It's, I have many fond memories of the hovel we used to be in on Walnut Street. <laughs> um, and it's obvious that Professor Farrell has done an enormous amount of work when you look at where the department and the program has come from being a very small department of preventive medicine and, and developing into the potential that it really had all the time. And so I want to thank you for the kind award and uh, the invitation to come to Madison again. Very kind of you. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. I am told I have a big mouth and don't necessarily need a microphone. What I would like to start out first is ask, how many of you seen the movie Goodbye Lenin? Has anybody seen the movie Goodbye Lenin? Goodbye Lenin is the story of a woman in East Germany who is a, a very strong supporter of East German communism, who has a stroke, goes into a coma, wakes up after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and her son goes through all these contortions to try to convince her that East Germany still exists. <laughs> Everything about East Germany, the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, literally, life disappeared overnight. And so you don't even recognize the world of East Germany anymore. And the same is also true for Diet Heart. Diet Heart was this hundred-year-old debate about what were the dietary risk factors for the development of high blood cholesterol and then the relationship of high blood cholesterol to the development of atherosclerosis and ultimately coronary artery disease. So, wait a second. I'm not very good with machinery. So, when you look at some of the timelines, you have Ignatowski in 1909 doing an experiment where he fed rabbits a diet that was high in meat and eggs and fat and cholesterol and developed atherosclerosis in these rabbits and then Anichkov actually discovered that one of the critical factors in developing atherosclerosis in rabbits was a high cholesterol diet. And then moving quickly through the timelines, you see that the group by Stamler at Chicago showed for one of the first times that cholesterol and saturated fat were related to an increased risk of dying from coronary heart disease in 1982. In 1984, you have the results of the Lipid Research Clinic's coronary primary prevention trial, which was the really groundbreaking event which led to the development of the National Cholesterol Education Program and the, the development of the clinical guidelines, which we now have. And that flowed very quickly into the Consensus Development Conference in 1985, and then the release of the first adult treatment panel guidelines for cholesterol, and how do I use this pointer? I don't. Ah, gospity. Yes, sir? Oh, dropping two things, that'll be good. All right. So again, in 1988. So, Notice that this long sequence of slow development in the understanding of diet heart. So, in 1989, Daniel Steinberg, a biochemist and pathologist, published a paper called The Cholesterol Controversy is Over. Why did it take so long? Then recently, 
in what can be only described as a concerted assault on Diet Heart. The group at Harvard has published a number of individual papers questioning the relationship of saturated fatty acid with coronary heart disease risk. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, think back to 1980. There are a number of us in the room who can think back to 1980. <laughs> number of us who don't want to. But in 1980, there was this tremendous debate about what was the relationship of diet to the risk of heart disease. The epidemiological studies of diet and heart disease failed almost consistently to show either a cross-sectional relationship between diet and blood levels of cholesterol or diet and risk of developing coronary heart disease in the future. So, and this lack of the ability to show correlations and relations of diet to risk of disease was a major component of the argument of those opposed to diet heart. So let's take a look at diet heart hypothesis, what it is, and what we'll do to look at that is by investigating the black box. But first of all, I want to remind you of a list of cohort studies and studies that are probably you've never heard of. Everyone's probably heard of Framingham, but have you heard of the seven countries or the Minnesota Business and Professional Men's Study? All of these studies were funded by National Institutes of Health, at that time called the Heart Institute, all over the world. Literally tens of thousands of people were focused at that time on trying to understand the fundamental causes of coronary heart disease because it was by way accounting for at least 50% of the deaths. And usually the first time an individual would know they had coronary heart disease was when they had their fatal heart attack. So it's so What's the right word? It's so dominated health research in that era. It's so dominated public health and epidemiology that in the era immediately after the cholesterol consensus conference, you saw a number of articles in epidemiology journals quite simply saying, well, what do we do now? So epidemiology, the real oh, catalyst for the development of epidemiology in the U.S. and around the world was diet heart. So let's look at the black box. And Microsoft PowerPoint is always an experience. You never know what special characters are going to do when you use them on a different computer. These were to have been arrows going down. <laughs> so like imagining 1980, imagine these as arrows going down. But the black box, as we all know, is that unknown or poorly described pathological process by which a risk factor leads to increased risk of the development of disease. In nutritional epidemiology, you have a nutritional exposure, you have an estimated intake, a true intake, and this estimated intake is usually only approximately estimated. Leads to absorbed and metabolically active levels of the nutrient. Then, depending upon the exposure, you can have alternate metabolism 
of physiological changes and then development of preclinical disease and then ultimately the disease itself. And this is often very poorly described, poorly understood. In the case of atherosclerosis, Anichkov had elucidated what he thought was the basic fundamental steps in the development of atherosclerosis in the 1930s. He has a very classic publication in around 1933 in which he, and then you see this in the literature if you read articles from Ansel Keys going back to the early 1950s. And Ansel Keys after World War II was one of the big movers in the adoption of Diet Heart. You've, everyone's heard of Ansel Keys? Who's heard of K rations for soldiers? They're named after Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys also did a very historic study on the physiological effects of starvation using uh, what was the what would be the term? There you go, during World War II. But here you have the black box paradigm for diet heart where total and LDL cholesterol are the biomarker, the key exposure biomarker, leads to atherosclerosis, preclinical disease, and heart disease. And it was hypothesized that diets high in the intake of saturated fatty acids and very specific saturated fatty acids, and dietary cholesterol led to a cascading series of events which led to a raising of total and LDL cholesterol, development of atherosclerosis, and eventually preclinical disease and heart disease. So that the salt Central question in nutritional epidemiology, and it certainly was in diet heart, was how does the usual level of intake of saturated fatty acids and cholesterol relate to the risk of developing either high blood cholesterol or coronary heart disease? So again, let's think back to 1980 and remind you that in epidemiologic studies, it was very, very difficult to show an association either cross-sectionally between diet and blood levels of cholesterol or diet and the risk of developing coronary heart disease in cohort studies. And the three issues, the three issue, fundamental issues that become evoked in the discussion of why it was so difficult are problems in measuring intake or the dietary survey methods, problems with measurement error or with in-person variability, and we'll see in a moment that Ansel Keys was the individual who brought to the attention of the world of epidemiology the issue of measurement error, and then what we want to talk about and end up with is a discussion of the fact there's a truism in nutrition. You do not eat nutrients, you eat food. And lots of nutrients are packaged together in the same foods. If you have a high meat diet where you do not cut off the visible fat, or if the fat is not, unless it's not well marbled, you're not only going to have a high protein intake, but you're going to have a high fat intake. So that the intakes of nutrients and other food components tend to be very highly correlated because they come from the same food choices. So we're going to look at that. But let's look first and quickly at dietary survey methods. There are a number of ways of measuring nutrient exposure. 
the one that we all think about most often is dietary intake from dietary survey methods. And the most common types of dietary survey methods, if you wanted to classify them into three basic categories, would be food records, recall or daily methods, and then the history or food frequency methods. Trouble is, no matter which method you use, whether it's 24-hour recalls, diet records, food frequencies, is they tend to have very severe systematic biases. By and large, people tend to underestimate their total energy or calorie intake on the order of 20 to 30 percent. It's not known or understood how that affects their reporting of the intake of the food sources or the nutrients that provide energy. Protein, fats, carbohydrates, and alcohol. Then you have also a problem in nutrition, dietary survey methods, what's usually called the flat slope syndrome. People who are, eat a lot tend to underestimate, and people that eat very little tend to overestimate. So dietary survey methods tend to be very flawed and that you really do need biomarkers or clinical signs and symptoms to really appropriately determine or interpret them. So you have instrument error and you have day-to-day -day variability in what we eat. And this day-to-day -day variation has a huge effect on assessing associations between and among risk factors and endpoints. So let's take a look at briefly the impact of within person variability. And then we'll, first we'll look at this figure. If you have one day's worth of intake, you tend to have a wide distribution and a distribution that's relatively flat and that when you correct for within-person variation using statistical procedures, or if you measure diet repeatedly over a long period of time, what you do is you move in the distribution from the tails, you have a narrower distribution, and a higher peak at the center. So that if you're looking at prevalence, of either inadequate or excess intake, unless you adjust for measurement error, either by multiple measures of diet or using statistical procedures, you're going to estimate incorrectly. At the low end, you will overestimate the numbers of individuals who have very low intakes and you'll overestimate those with very large intakes. Now, it not only, this measurement error not only affects estimates of prevalence, but it also affects measures of association. If you do look at a univariate relationship between, say, dietary saturated fat intake and oh, let's say something without much measurement error over a brief period of time. Say weight. The larger the amount of within-person variation in saturated fat, the lower your observed correlation between saturated fat and BMI. However, if you're looking at a multivariate model, the bias of measurement error, especially when you have multiple covariates within your model which have measurement error, is 
that it can bias it either positively or negatively. And this has become a huge point of concern in clinical chemistry and trying to adjust for within person variation to keep your lab methodology error down and to be able to interpret the lab methods based on biological variability. So you have within person not only in dietary survey methods but in laboratory methods as well. Now let's look at some of the timelines on the issue of dietary survey methods and the impact of within-person variation. Again, Ansel Keys in a Dutch journal, Vording, in about 1965, it was about a page within a very long article on the seven countries study and the dietary survey methods in seven countries first introduces the concept of within-person variation and shows that associations are going to be biased towards the null because of the large amount of day-to-day -day variability in intake of food. And doctors Gardner and Hetty, Liu et al. and Beaton then quite about 10, 15 years later published some very seminal articles on the statistics of the impact of within-person variability on associations. The first article by Stamler in 1982 again, the Consensus Development Conference in 1985, at which point we thought the whole debate about cholesterol was over. And then finally in 1990, Rosner et al. published a statistical procedure for multivariate adjustment when you have a model with lots of different covariates and within person variability. But to be honest, this is a topic that becomes a big concern every few years when people rediscover it, and then it's quickly ignored, simply because of the cost and logistical problems in collecting multiple measures of so many covariates that have diet within person variability. So it becomes a big issue and then it's quickly forgotten. But in 19, around 1980, it was a huge factor. And the group from Minnesota, the epidemiology group, published an, an article on diet and serum cholesterol do zero correlations negate the relationship between diet and heart disease? Because this was a, you, it's very difficult. It's like trying to explain the Soviet Union, which is passed out of our consciousness. How much of an impact this had on accepting diet heart? Really, to be quite honest, the observational epidemiology was a drag on the acceptance of diet heart. So let's look at the measurement issues and the issue of correlation among nutrients in the diet and its impact in trying to assess the relationship of individual components of energy intake and how they relate to the risk of developing heart disease. So, first let's review what do we use multivariate models for in epidemiology. We use them to predict or to interpret. And did I do something? I'm sure I did. I'm not very good with machinery, as you've noticed. I don't think this is you. Uh, then it's me. Get <laughs> so while we're trying to get the slides back, I would if I were you too. <laughs> All right. 
I'll try not to do anything again. But you want to use models to either predict or interpret. If you're looking at prediction, you want a subset of variables which gives you the highest R squared, for example, in regular regression. There's no interpretation put on the signs or the level of the magnitude of the coefficient. And there are what you would call explicit solutions. There is a best model. If you're looking for using multivariate analysis for interpretation, you're trying to attach biological meaning to the interpretation of the coefficients. And quite honestly, you can say that the models are being used to simulate an experiment in the laboratory by correcting statistically for confounding. So the problem is that the choice of variables and the choice of your algorithm for determining your best model can affect what are ultimately the significant variables in your model. So therefore, explicit solutions do not exist. There is no best model. This is really a, a fundamental problem in trying to do modeling in, in statistics and in epidemiology. As George Box, who was a famous statistician from the University of Wisconsin Department of Statistics once said, all statistics are wrong, some are useful. So, and we generally tend to use a sort of limited set of models, and what do we have? Scissors, eyeglasses? <laughs> yeah, it's... And Microsoft won. I mean, right? WordPerfect and other things just disappeared. <laughs> but they won because they're the best. <laughs> All right. I have to put my glasses on. Yes. That's supposed, the scissors are supposed to be an alpha. And the glasses are a beta. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Javier. You were going, meant to be an optometrist, too. <laughs> All right. So, so we use these sorts of models in risk factor assessment. Now, doesn't matter which one you use, so let's get off that slide. Let's say you have a model where the dependent variable is the probability of developing coronary heart disease. And you're trying to relate that to a set of potential risk factors. You have an intercept or the underlying sort of average risk. And then the, all these potential risk factors. When you do the statistical modeling, when you compute the coefficients and their signs, you hold all the other variables in the model constant. So that one variable is being allowed to change and vary, while everything else is being held constant. Now, remember that fact, and then remember that when you look at a model, you have to decide if your model makes sense physiologically. Does what you're trying to model make sense? Could you do that kind of model in the laboratory? Oops. So let's take this model. You want to look at the effect of energy intake, physical activity, and BMI. So let's say we're going to focus on BMI. That's our big variable. That's our exposure of interest. We are going to hold calories constant. We are going to hold 
physical activity constant. And then we are going to look at the risk of BMI to CHD risk by varying BMI. Can you think of a laboratory experiment where you hold calories and activity constant but vary body mass index? Is that possible? I think a lot of times as epidemiologists we become very mechanical about how we do data analysis and we don't necessarily think about what are the physiological implications of what we're trying to model. So let's look at another one, which is more complex and certainly would generate much more argument. Here you have trying to look at the relationship of HDL and triglycerides to the risk of developing heart disease, and this is something people have fought over for 20, 30 years. Can you put HDL and triglycerides in the same model? They are metabolically linked. It's triglycerides go up, HDL goes down. Triglycerides go down, HDL goes up. So physiologically, can you conceive of holding HDL constant while varying triglycerides. The objective is to try to assess what is the association between HDL and triglycerides to CHD risk holding the other constant. Or what is the residual effect after adjusting for HDL? of triglycerides. While that's a reasonable question to ask, the other question that's also reasonable to say is, can you do it in the same model, where you try to hold one constant and vary the other? So let's also think of a third model, where you're looking at calorie intake, protein, carbohydrate, and fat intake from some dietary survey method. Here you have the problem that sources of energy come from the same foods. So that it's very hard, even in a laboratory setting, in a, in a laboratory where you're feeding specific diets, to hold energy, protein, and carbohydrate constant while you're varying fat. Very difficult. Very often you have to go to liquid diets in a metabolic ward study because it's so difficult to do. So then let's look at the issue that intakes of macro and micronutrients can be highly correlated because they're from the same food sources. The metabolism of the nutrients may also be highly correlated. And my contention is, and this is certainly one that many would not agree with, my contention is that correlation cannot be overcome by the use of multivariate models. And let's look at some results from really a very famous paper by Dr. Dan McGee that was published in 1984. And then let's look at the correlation between calories, protein, total fat, which is fat of all sources, mono, poly, saturated, and carbohydrate. And notice that the correlation of protein with fat is quite high. The correlation of protein to carbohydrate is much lower, and the correlation of fat to carbohydrate is lower still. These are data from the Honolulu Heart Program, which is a, a really a quite famous prospective study that was started right after World War II, looking at the relationship of risk of diet to heart disease in Japanese Americans who had been veterans of World War II. So, what happens when you try to run bivariate logistic regression models? And 
just as an aside, a historical aside, Dr. McGee published the first logistic regression program used for an IBM XT in 1988. When you think how recent that is, and most of the students in your class just kind of glaze over when you say that. Okay. <laughs> but looking in bivariately, if you group different nutrients together and relate them to heart disease, you get very different results depending on how you group them together. Whoops. If you do three variables at a time, Notice how the magnitude of the coefficients and even at times the sign on the coefficients can vary depending upon which nutrients you're grouping together. If you put all four, look here, whereas in the past slide, I didn't show it, mention it, but carbohydrate, the coefficient tended to be negative. Now it's positive. It's not significant, but it's positive. And then if you do either forward or backward regression, you come up ultimately with two very different models. So the way you procedure you use to select your best model can affect which are ultimately the variables that you will select. So, and this is a quote from the paper by McGee, and I'd like to read it if I may. If the question is simply whether dietary variables as a group predict CHD and we are not interested in the exact relationship of a particular diet variable to CHD, solutions exist. If, on the other hand, we are interested in interpreting how a particular diet variable relates to the outcome controlling for other diet variables, the collinearity of the data appears to be structural, appears to be astructural rather than a mathematical problem with no apparent solution. Now we come to the, cons the conclusion of the recent analysis on a meta-analysis of prospective studies looking at diet and heart disease, where they've come to the conclusion that dietary saturated fatty acids are not related to the risk of developing heart disease. Now, what was the chain of reasoning then which accounted for the general acceptance of a relationship between diet and heart disease? Well, again, we said in epidemiologic studies, it was very difficult to show a cross-sectional relationship between diet and lipids, and it was difficult in that it only occurred near the end of the diet-heart debate before the consensus conference where they were able to show a relationship between diet and risk of heart disease. But in the interim, you had an enormous amount of research around the world, in vitro studies, different animal models, especially non-human primates, feeding studies where you could show a direct relationship between the precisely known amounts of fat and cholesterol in the diet and a lipid response. And you had the observational studies of blood cholesterol and risk of heart disease, total serum cholesterol. This was, a fundam this was the contribution of epidemiology to the diet-heart debate. Universally, a positive, graded, linear relationship was found between the level of cholesterol and LDL 
and your risk of developing heart disease. And there were a few clinical trials of diet that were successful. But here is what was done. You had to split that black box into two black boxes, essentially, for human research. You could show very accurately, and Ansel Keys and David Heg Mark Hegstead, their groups showed very systematically the amount of intake of saturated fatty acids and even specific saturated fatty acids, especially C14 and C16, raised total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, whereas polyunsaturated fatty acids tended to reduce the cholesterol level when they were used to replace saturated fatty acids in the diet, and that dietary cholesterol. Actually, dietary cholesterol had the least impact on serum cholesterol levels, if you look at the equations from Keyes and Hegstead. So we have this first box where we show that diet's related to lipid levels. And then we have this second black box where we could show very consistently and almost universally in observational studies the total LD and LDL cholesterol were positively related to the risk of developing heart disease. Then you had... Am I going backwards or forwards? I never know. Been doing that for a long time. All right. The Cholesterol Consensus Conference in 1985 came to the conclusion that Five minutes. Yes, sir. I apologize. I tend to drivel on at times. What was important is the amount of animal work, in vitro work, especially in rhesus monkeys where you could feed them a diet high in saturated fat and cholesterol, cause atherosclerosis and heart disease, and you could reverse it by changing the diet. In epidemiologic studies, you had this strong, consistent, graded relationship between blood cholesterol and CHD risk. International comparison, migrant studies, autopsy studies, feeding studies, all supporting the diet heart hypothesis. You had a few small clinical trials, the VA clinical trial, you had the Oslo study, and then the Finnish mental health hospital study. And then the real catalyst for getting the acceptance of, or for having the consensus conference and even for starting the National Cholesterol Education Program was the slightly positive result from the LRC CPPT trial. I say slightly positive because they changed it from a two-sided test to a one-sided test and buried it from 0.05 to 0.1. But without that success, there would not have been the consensus conference. So, what are some of the lessons that I believe have not been learned from diet heart? One, there's a tremendous amount of error in dietary survey methods. And a paper by Rule Stallones, a famous epidemiologist, was the wonder of all this is not that the methods do not work well, but that they work at all. The effects of within person variability, and what I believe is the fundamental limitation, is that the correlation among nutrients and diets cannot be removed by statistical methods. And to quote Ansel Keys, None of this is to decry efforts in dietary epidemiology, but what is needed is to use this approach with less naive expectation. Much more, but more sophisticated effort in dietary epidemiology is what's needed. And it would be my suggestion that every department of population health or epidemiology have a course strictly devoted to diet heart. <laughs>
And then I would like to acknowledge a lot of dear friends and mentors that I've had over the years from this department. Dr. Nieto and I worked for about 20 years within about 40 miles of each other and never knew each other, and I, I really regret that we hadn't met much earlier. It would have been very nice if we had. Dr. Don D'Alessio, he was... I can't say enough kind words about Dr. D'Alessio and his efforts to help me get a master's degree in, in epidemiology. Dr. Canarac, I took his Epi-2 course his first semester here. And the nice thing about Dr. Canarac's course was his emphasis on thinking rather than looking for statistically significant results. Norman Draper was my advisor for my minor in applied statistics. Alfred Harper was the chair of nutrition at the time and was a very big help to me. My advisor in nutrition, Nancy Johnson, very kind, patient woman. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge Everett Smith, who I worked with in the basement of, uh, what was it? Yes, Walnut. I was in the uh, furnace room <laughs> for about four years. Big hole in the window, which in the winter was hard to ignore. But uh, to say that I could be hard to work with is an understatement. And Everett Smith was really very kind to me. And I I learned a great deal from working with him. So thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me.